I am going to take a risk. As a speaker, I am completely dependent upon your approval. I need you to trust me. So in order to deserve your trust, to gain your trust, I shall need to tell you a personal anecdote. Because by telling you a personal anecdote, I will provide you with the relevant information that you need to assess my trustworthiness, right? Well, I'm not going to do this, because you and I know that trust simply does not work this way. Trust is not a matter of having sufficient information. Trust is all about how we deal with situations in which information is lacking. So I'm going to tell you a different anecdote instead, a very old anecdote. It's about two brothers in ancient Greece, 2,500 years ago, called Chirecrates and Chirophon. Right? <laughs> so Chirecrates and Chirophon. Let's just call them Peter and Paul. <laughs> well, the thing with Peter and Paul is they just won't get along. They have disappointed each other so many times that they're both unwilling to take the first step in reconciliation. They're unwilling to make the first move. So what do they do? Well, they go to mediation. They go to this moral therapist called Socrates, and this Socrates immediately understands the nature of the situation. And he gives this very puzzling piece of advice. He says, well, what you guys need, both of you, is a change in attitude. You need to become willing again to take risks because risk-taking is what will improve the quality of your relationship. So what's this? Are we supposed to just go first, to take risks, to live dangerously and to trust? Shouldn't others deserve our trust first? Is morality more about trusting than about being trustworthy? More about trusters than about trustees? Well, Socrates says, absolutely. Whenever the ancient Greeks think about trust as a moral quality, they think about trusters. They think about the capacity to actively confer trust upon another person. So when they picture themselves a caricature of absolute moral failure, they think of a tyrant, greedy, lustful, and incapable of trusting anyone. The epitome of virtue, the embodiment of every single virtue you know, is a person we all know very well. It's our mother. She is the supreme truster, the greatest benefactor in our lives, because not only has she given us the gift of life, but she has also invested years of troubles, hardships, sleepless nights for a person she didn't really know when she took on all of this and without ever having the security that this person, you, will ever be willing and capable of reciprocating this immense favor. She has taken the biggest leap of faith. And because she was willing to take such, so great a risk with so little security, she is the person in our lives that we are indebted our greatest gratitude to. So to the Greeks, Trust is a moral virtue because it presupposes risk-taking. By the very act of trusting you, your mother has raised the standards and the quality of your relationship. So this is a very particular way of understanding trust, trust as risk-taking. And this very particular idea about trust is related to a revolutionary development in history, the invention of money. This is the first time in history, 2,500 years ago, in which money starts to become an immensely successful phenomenon. People start to use money for almost everything. Money starts to invade the minds of people. Why was money so successful? Well, for one thing, it makes life a lot easier. Money diminishes the need for personal trust because money enables you to exchange on a simultaneous, on an immediate basis, which means you never ever have to see the other person again. You don't have to invest anything in your relationship 
with the other person. So money means that compensation is guaranteed, and compensation means no risk. But no risks, no trust. So the ancient Greeks felt that money may be a substitute for trust, but it's not really the same thing. It's not the, th it's not the thing that makes our relationships work. So as a reaction to the monetization of society, the ancient Greek philosophers start to re-emphasize the value of personal trust, the value of risk-taking. According to these moral philosophers, such as uh, Socrates, moral excellence starts with active partnership, with paying it forward, with giving without having the security of a return. So that's how conflict resolution works, according to Socrates. When he urges Peter, the elder brother, to make the first move in reconciliation with Paul, he appeals to this principle of active partnership. Pay it forward. That's what every personal relationship is all about. If you want someone to invite you over for dinner, have him over for dinner first. If you want to go couch surfing across the world, Open your house to others first. Pay it forward. But Peter is a bit hesitant, but because what if all this taking initiatives and paying it forward, well, does it really pay off? Does it work? Socrates is positive because he knows Paul. He knows Paul is an ambitious guy who knows a good challenge when he sees one. So Peter's initiatives will provoke Paul to take up the challenge and, and compete by being even more generous. There will be a competition of generosity, goodwill and trust. There will be a high quality relationship again. And if not, there is no such thing as a waste of generosity. Worst case scenario is that Peter will have revealed himself to be the better brother. Materially speaking, trust may be risking damage, but morally speaking, there is no damage, because taking risks by actively trusting another person is what makes you morally superior. It, it's what makes you the better person. That's how trust works. So what did happen the past few minutes is that you and I tried to be active partners. I gave it a shot by speaking for an immense unknown audience, and you too took the leap of faith by deciding to hear me out. We invested in the quality of our collaboration. We paid it forward. Thank you.